Today, what we will cover most is obviously why and the motivation of why we're doing this today. And, and then we're going to take you, take you guys through the different architecture that we've built. We are trying to set up a demo for you live. Um, we'll, see, we'll see if the, the demo gods are with us. We did sacrifice a few clusters this morning, so let's see if that comes through. And, um, and then obviously we'll, we'll have some questions and, uh, and, and we'll have some fun together. So my name is Pedro Oliveira. I'm a senior solutions architect at SpectroCloud. And I'm joined here today with my esteemed friend, Tyler. Hi, everyone. I'm Tyler. Is it live? Yeah. Um, pleased to be here today. Honored to be presenting here at KubeCon. Um, I'm a principal software engineer at Spectral Cloud, and I manage our advanced projects team. So we get to build POCs with all the latest, greatest, exciting Kubernetes tech, and then sometimes integrate it with the core platform. One example being two node HA. You get to play with the cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's what it means. Cool. So let's, uh, let's take a, a step back and try to picture the scene that we're an enterprise that effectively is managing or running different petrol station stores or maybe different coffee shops or perhaps a retailer, right? And in this scenario, the matter of the fact is that you will have a lot of locations, right? So perhaps you want to deploy uh, Kubernetes applications there at the edge because you're going through some transformation and you want to give your customers a better user experience or perhaps you're running inferencing at the edge because these days everything is about AI. And as you do that, your applications need to be highly available, okay? So because they're critical. There are situations where you might be able to get away with a one node um, running those applications. And if that's the case, and your mean time to resolution, if the application goes down is a few hours or maybe a few days and you can sustain that, then that's okay. But what we see actually with most of our customers and enterprises that we work with is that there's a massive need to actually run business critical applications at the edge. And when this comes, you actually need to have highly available infrastructure and obviously highly available applications. What this means is things really start to stack up, okay? If we're in the data center, things are easy, right? We have highly available power, we have highly available virtual machines, bare metal nodes, life is good. But at the edge, that's not really the case. Sometimes we're, we're highly constrained when it comes to power, when it comes to size, and uh, also when it comes to money, because things really start to add up. So high, high availability at the edge really typically means multiplying everything by three. Okay, so, and why is that? And uh, I think everyone will be very familiar with etcd. So typically, etcd is the culprit. And um, what really happens is, obviously, etcd is the distributed key value store for Kubernetes. And etcd uses Raft, which is a consensus algorithm to figure out uh, who's the leader and who's in charge. Now, you can run etcd with two nodes, but you have no failover. If that two node goes down, then your etcd has basically a catastrophic failure because you lose quorum. And if you guys have been doing Kubernetes long enough and you have to restore etcd, you'll know how hard that is. Doesn't matter how CKA makes it look easy, it's really not. It's really not. So we really trying to look at how can we move away from this in a way that, as the title says, we move from two, from three, and we, we go into two. So are there other alternatives? So we, we, we spoke about single node. Yes, we can go with single node, but then you have no, no failover. So if that goes down, and if that's okay with you, if your mean time to resolution, if your critical applications can go down for perhaps hours, maybe days, that's okay. But then you have to perhaps ship your engineer out. Um, they will have to go there because the, manage, the store manager doesn't know anything about Kubernetes or computers or whatever it might be. Then do node etcd, it's kind of the same, it's pretty much the same as almost running a one node cluster because if that cluster goes down, and let's, let's do the maths, right? If, if we're doing things at scale, tens of thousands of devices or even 
thousands of devices, the probability of an SSSD disk to fail on 2,000 devices is really high, right? So there will be failures. And if those failures exist, then etcd gets locked, and then we, we get into a conundrum. External etcd, yes, we can go that route, but then we are just adding more complexity to our, to our architecture. And the same goes for cloud witnesses or external witnesses where perhaps you move this to the cloud at CD or you will have a witness to then manage who's the leader, who's right, who's wrong, all that kind of stuff. But the problem is, again, you're adding complexity. And not only that, what happens if your connectivity is spotty, if you have intermittent connectivity or if you have to be air gapped, then this doesn't actually quite covers all ranges. So we really went out on a quest, me and Tyler. I put my blonde wig up, Tyler's Frodo, kind of never seen them, seen them in the same room together. Um, and on this great quest, we, we set out to effectively go after a few things. And these are our principles for deploying two node, highly available applications at the edge. So we're focusing on two node infrastructure with highly available stateless applications. And the key here is highly available applications. We're not focusing on infrastructure availability. We're focusing on application availability, okay? So that's the first one. Architecturally simple. So when it comes to external etcd, external witness, we, we don't want to deal with any of that. So we want to be architecturally simple so it's easy to deploy, manage, and maintain, okay? No external dependencies, as I mentioned, and what we really didn't want to run into is these computer science conundrums. So we don't want to have to solve the two generals rule. We don't want to go into, the, into that rabbit hole. No control, we don't want to redesign control plane logic. None of that. So we really try to make things simple. And when I say we, I really mean Tyler. He's, uh, he's the brains behind it. So, the, the other thing that I just wanted to, to point out is when I mentioned these highly available applications, um, I really, one of the things is obviously you can start using things like node affinity, anti-affinity rules, all that kind of stuff, but in, in the application that we're actually running for our demo to the gods, um, we are actually using the, the latest topology spread constraints, okay? And this basically just spreads our application into the two nodes that we have, that we have available. Um, and, and this allows it to have highly available application. So, onto the money now. How does it work? Okay, so here we see the uh, standard configuration in a uh, happy path. And we have these two machines. Uh, fundamentally, they're powered by Kairos, which is a meta Linux distribution, uh, which allows you to pick your OS and Kubernetes version, in this case, K3S and ship that um, bootable image as a container. So that's what gets us K3S in the first place. And I've split out the control plane components just for illustration purposes. They're obviously bundled um, in reality. And then sitting beneath that, we have a couple of things, Kine and Postgres, which are layered into the image during build time. So they're immediately available on boot. And then we have our liveness agent, which alongside some other controllers that are SpectroCloud specific, manage the state of the system. So there are a couple different state machines, one that executes every time the machine turns on, and then a continuous reconciliation loop that we call the liveness service. We'll get into that a little bit more um, in, in further detail, but the gist of it is that the leader machine um, is configured so that Kine points to Postgres running on localhost, and then Postgres is also running on localhost on the follower, but it has a separate Kine configuration which points to the leader's Postgres database. And there's some convoluted, well, not that convoluted, but there's a little bit of a back and forth to ensure that the databases have the same authentication. Um, and then we have logical replication configured basically to copy state. So every write that hits the leader um, gets streamed over to the follower and that's eventually consistent. And these liveness agents are constantly pinging each other with health checks and they will change the state of the system depending on what they find out. Do we... 
It's 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 coming up. Yeah, I okay. think it's coming up. Should I go? Yeah. Um, so we are waiting for our cluster to come up because we have to reconfigure. So we we will move on with the architecture and hopefully come back with a demo for you guys. Real demo. Okay, so assuming the leader goes down, um, what we call a promotion will happen where the follower decides that it has to be in charge. <clears throat> so maybe the power cord just got unplugged or maybe the hard drive failed, could be anything, but we're in a situation now where all of a sudden the leader is no longer online. So I mentioned health checks. Um, we do just an ICMP ping between the two hosts. We also do a TCP connection to the API server um, and also the kubevip endpoint. So I didn't mention that earlier, but that's we're using kubevip to load balance between the two control planes. And then any traffic that's routed to the follower in the standard configuration um, will just actually via the kind configuration end up sending any writes to the database on the leader. Um, so we have this default period, it's configurable, but every 30 seconds we run these checks and if enough of them fail, we'll decide that we have to initiate the promotion. And in that case, we stop all of these services and this is initiated by the liveness agent. And then we do a little bit of magic um, to swap the kind endpoint. So basically we just reconfigure kind instead of pointing to the leader, we now point to Postgres running on localhost. And then with a little bit of SQL, we massage things so that the uh, database is the way we want it when it boots up again. So really this is a learning I had, which is that uh, streaming replication doesn't replicate sequences. The database is gonna look okay, but really it has holes in it. And uh, you know, there's high valued IDs, then you turn on K3S and all of a sudden you're getting rows coming in underneath, which are violating the constraint of the kind table, which is that you shouldn't have a previous revision higher than the current ID. And anyway, we figure that out. And um, we also delete the uh, Kubernetes default services endpoints, which forces K3S to drop the WebSocket tunnel to the impaired host. And that just makes K3S a little bit happier. So once we've massaged things to how we want, we turn the services back on. And now we're in this single node operating state, which is fine. And there might have been a small amount of data loss. I just want to um, clarify that. So in terms of cap theorem, I would say we have like a AP with a big asterisk um, or a medium asterisk. So we can survive network partitions, um, as I've illustrated here. If things go down, the, the leader just resumes. But had there have been a write that hit the, the, the leader at the moment that it went down, then that would be lost. Um, and in terms of availability, like we said, our goal was to achieve high availability for the app, for a stateless app, and there is no downtime. But during this reboot process that I explained, it does take about three minutes for Kind to turn back on. So during that time, we basically lose API server writeability. But at the edge, that's maybe not such a big concern because the application is running and that's what matters. There's often not a lot of changes hitting the API server at a remote edge location. So three minutes go by, the services come back up, and now we're good to go again. Um, so that's kind of the asterisk on the availability. But at that point, we have a couple of options. Maybe the power cord just got unplugged, um, in which case, plug it back in. The uh, original leader, uh, call it leader prime, turns back on, and then we initiate what's called a demotion. Um, Second option is maybe it's you know, irremediably damaged and in that case, we're gonna need to get a replacement host. So we ship the failed host off, get another one, um, it comes in the mail to the retail store or what have you. You just plug it back in, make a few edits on our user interface, which we'll hopefully show you here soon. And then uh, we perform a host replacement. <clears throat> but first, let's consider what happens in the demotion scenario. So uh, we have leader prime and it just reboots. So now we have uh, this other state machine called the kind endpoint reconciler. And 
It's a one-shot system D unit that just monitors the configuration for Kine on boot. So prior to letting Kine turn on, it will reach out to the liveness agent on the other node and ask, you know, what's the current state of the world from your perspective? And it's going to respect the opinion of the other node over what it sees. Or if there's a difference, essentially, it'll say, okay, well, I think I'm the leader, but your state is more fresh than mine, and you think you're the leader, so I must not be the leader. Um, in which case, the kind reconfiguration will happen to point to the new leader, and then um, the database gets dropped completely, and then we reconfigure the streaming replication um, from zero. So that way we avoid any, this is how we survive network partitions, is we do a complete recopy um, when this machine starts. Um, and now it's our new follower, aka warm, warm standby, at least from the database perspective. <clears throat> so now you can see we've got logical replication configured in the opposite direction and similarly kind. And of course the health checks will resume at this point and we're able to you know, flip flop back and forth as needed. So what if we aren't able to do that because it's not as simple as just an unplugged machine? In this case, um, we just, like I said, get the new device in the mail, plug it in, it'll become available um, in a pool of edge nodes on our user interface. This can also be done declaratively, um, not through user interface, but essentially what will happen is this new follower will boot and it has an updated version of what the cluster should look like and it will basically announce that via um, an API. So there's two, the two liveness agents are also running liveness servers. They can communicate that way and it will just say, hey, I'm your new follower, forget about your, the follower you used to know about. Um, and what that looks like is pictured here. It's simple, like you, you know, I think we're familiar with the diagram at this point, but uh, you, we've got the replacement host on the left and it just basically tells the leader that it's the new person to communicate with. It'll set up replication, copy the database, and we're good to go. <clears throat> what about upgrades? So there are options. We've chosen a simple option that does involve a little bit of downtime, but we basically disable the liveness checks in order to ensure that we are able to upgrade both the hosts without any change in behavior of the state machine. So we tell both of them to just stop caring, and then we arbitrarily upgrade one and then upgrade the other. And there are other ways to do this. You could, you know, it would require two state changes per machine though, and that's a lot of change basically, which in involves risk. So for now, this is what we've opted to do. And uh, like I said, there's no promotions or demotions. They retain their original roles, but there is some downtime for the API server when the leader gets rebooted. Um, we use system update controller to stream the new Kairos image, um, or it can be loaded in with local content, but essentially there's a reboot involved during the upgrade. And for the period of time it takes for the machine to boot, then the API server on the um, leader can't accept writes, but of course you can still read on the follower and applications will be up. <clears throat> so, Logical replication is really just a form of change data capture, and which is a common pattern where something happens on one machine and you want to stream that in near real time to another in order to maintain consistent state or as close to it as possible. We initially worked with a tool called Marmot, but due to some issues with FIPS compatibility, we ultimately landed on Postgres. Marmot uses NATS under the hood and really hoping that NATS will be FIPS compliant here soon, but that was a, a small hiccup. Etcd mirroring is another thing that we might consider in the future. Um, Postgres's logical replication is just pretty battle tested, so we went with that for now. I already mentioned the sequences, but uh, that's just a good thing to know. You, read, you should read all the docs before you try anything. Um, and then zero time, zero downtime upgrades, maybe something for the future. And then the big thing that, that we need to look at is persistent storage with uh, Longhorn is the most likely candidate that'll allow us to have synchronous uh, data replication, but perhaps at the cost of performance, although it's not, uh, there's nothing about this architecture that would preclude stateful workloads. It's just, if they need high performance, that might be a concern. 
Is the, yeah. Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll show you guys a little bit of a, of a demo. The plan was to show you, we have three nooks, not because we're doing three nodes, because we're doing two nodes and the goal was to replace one. Um, the demo gods are not with us today, at least in this room. So what we're gonna do is we do have a backup plan where we can use our USDC. Uh, so we have, uh, a, we have, yeah, the two node at the bottom. So if Tyler goes to that two node, so we have a, effect, effectively it's the same thing, right? But we have two node AJ running in S2 virtual machines instead of bare metal, but the concept is obviously the same. So if Tyler goes to the nodes, you'll be able to see that you'll have, we have two nodes, we have a leader, we have a follower. This is Pallet, our Spectre Cloud product, where you're able to manage and orchestrate clusters at scale. Um, in, this, in this scenario now, if Tyler VPNs into, into our USDC lab, um, and we will be able to see, so we have a highly available application, which is Super Mario or Game Box, which allows you to play um, the, the, the good games from back in the day, highly pixelated games. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you Mario running uh, and then we're gonna kill or pause, stop one of the VMs uh, and then you, we will see which one. So basically we will pause, we will show you a promotion. So we will pause the leader, okay? So that the follower has to take over and then you will see uh, most of what, um, you'll see most of what Tyler just shown you in logs, so on and so forth in Alkine and K3S we'll have to restart, so on and so forth. So we'll just have to go for a quick, uh, quick setup here and, uh, and we'll, show you, we'll show you that for now. Awesome, so what, what, um, what Tyler is now doing is basically he's grabbing the Liveness Pro lo uh, logs, which is the, media, the, the screen in the middle so that screen is gonna show you when the liveness probes fail. And uh, as you heard earlier, so we have some checks. So, and we're checking every so often. And if it fails, if sequentially those checks fail, obviously we're gonna fail over. So things like network partitioning, unplugging, or even the completely failure of the device. So if we go there, and if you click on the 8000 port as well, so that, so that's our application, so that's Mario, as you can see, and we're happy to share this, so if you guys wanna play in your own time. Um, but it's pretty cool, pretty cool application. As you can see, it's running. He's, I promise you, he's doing it behind the computer. Uh, I think you can hear it even. Um, but, um, but yeah, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cube config uh, into, the, into, into the cluster as, as Tyler said, we're using kubevip, so we, cube, we are load balancing between the API servers. We'll be able to see, um, I, can, I can kill it oh. from here. Yeah, I'll just check which IP it is. So uh, while Tyler, uh, once Tyler is set up, I'll be able to, I'll, I will be able to, yeah. You have the, yeah, in the node. I'll be able to do it. So, just finding the node right now. So, hard refresh here. And we will have Can you show me the IP of the leader because my internet is having a good time? 107, awesome, thank you. Uh, so look at this one. Yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna kill the leader right now. So I'm just gonna power it off. And uh, we'll start to see some liveness probes failing as well. And, and obviously the status is gonna to change to ready. So Tyler, if you wanna go back to the, 
Super Mario. The game is still playable. And as you can see, some of the liveness is going, is going through. And we will see. Yeah, so we have a couple liveness checks that have failed here. And as soon as another iteration goes through, we'll have sufficient failures to initiate uh, promotion. So we see we're below the failure threshold of three here. Um, and we're printing out which checks have failed. Um, just give it another 15 seconds or so, and we'll start to see some more stuff happen. <clears throat> okay, so the control plane endpoint is down, and our kubectl get nodes failed, which is expected. It'll be about three minutes before that comes back up. And we see there um, this machine was the follower, and it says initiating promotion. And because of the grep that I have, we didn't see all the logs. So one second. Uh, I believe what's happened is it has stopped, it has killed Kine, or will be killing Kine here soon. Let's just see if the user interface is showing us that that edge host is, edge host is down yet. Yeah, we'll have to give it some time. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll give it some time and obviously we are always constrained on that, uh, so we'll just finalize it. We'll open for for questions, and then uh, and then we'll come back. As we have some questions, we'll come back to this. <clears throat> so if you go back to the yeah. So as you saw, we did get to play some Super Mario, um, and like I said, we're more than happy to to share this with with you guys. The idea here is that. We are building this architecture so that at scale, as you deploy your Kubernetes clusters um, on different, across different industries, right? So like I mentioned, if you have your petrol stations, your retail stores, your coffee shops, um, and you are starting to push all these highly available Kubernetes clusters, things start to add up, right? And, uh, and then if you want to make your CFO happy, then having the ability to have all of these highly available capabilities with a 33% reduction in price in hardware alone will actually be a reason to put a smile on his face, right? And when we're talking about thousands of devices, tens of thousands of devices, most likely, which is the kind of skill that we tend to deal with our customers, then we're looking at hundreds of thousands of euros, dollars, pounds in savings in hardware alone. And then we have to count for cabling, engineers on site, so on and so forth. And as of today, the other very important part to talk about is obviously sustainability as well. So if you're shipping out less devices, you, you're reducing your footprint as well because obviously less size, uh, less power drawn, so on and so forth. So back to the dynamic duo of two highly available nodes. It's not me and Tyler, it's the two nodes. Uh, although I would be Batman, it can be Robin. And um, so, yeah, so what are the next steps? The, where do we go from here? So effectively, as Tyler said, so this is a project that we're running in our, in our uh, advanced project team, right, which is run by our CEO and led by, uh, led by Tyler. And uh, we effectively have a tech preview, an exclusive tech preview that we're announcing in this, in this talk, and we have about five places left. We have three customers running today, this tech preview with us. So if you guys would like to join, we have five places left, so please come and talk to us. We also have, uh, we also have a, another talk 
which is going to be with uh, one customer of ours, Dentply, and they are rolling out 3,000 edge devices this year for uh, dentists. Um, and that's going to be in 255 on SO4. And, you know, come talk to us. Uh, let's schedule a meeting. We can go deeper and go take a deep dive onto this, play some Mario or Aladdin or Doom, whatever you, you choose. And please give us, give us some feedback. So if you guys have some questions, we're more than happy to hear. Yes, we have questions. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Thanks for, for a great talk. Uh, do, you, do you implement any split brain mitigations like stony or something like that? Yeah, so with a split brain scenario, we would resolve that by, it would have to require you, a selection of which node you, you want to be the winner, basically, which, like I said before, there's the opportunity for a little bit of loss of, of state if some rights hit the leader and then it failed and they didn't replicate to the follower. But let's just say they're both um, unable to communicate. Like, you mean with a network partition, most likely? Yeah. Okay, so they're both, the follower would promote, you'd have two leaders, and you would have inconsistency. Now, you just need to decide which one you want to win. And all you would do is reboot the machine. Like, assuming you have restored the connectivity, you just reboot the one that you don't want to be the leader. It will um, get demoted. So it'll drop its database. The replication will copy the content of the leader you selected, and then you'll be back in, in action. So, Sorry, can we have the microphone very quickly? Uh, for him. I mean, they are going to compete, yeah? Because uh, if you have two nodes that think that they are uh, primary, then they are going to compete and how they are going to resolve who's going to win. Like, that's why I was asking about the stonic, like, should the other node in the head, if you have that kind of an approach or uh, how, how this is going to resolve? Uh, you said something was solid? Sorry, I didn't... Stonic. Like, like, this was... Uh, uh, solution back then when there was a uh, uh, redundancy for routers when you have this similar approach you have like two competing nodes and when uh, like there was a kind of a, uh, com a competition uh, one tried to kill the other and the one that wins that the wins and we have a winner uh, but okay i get that uh, this is kind of a not right now implemented. Yeah, well, I mean, they couldn't communicate, so how would one kill the other? But they both have a state file, which represents their understanding of the state of the world. And assuming that the network barrier is removed, one of them would have a newer timestamp, and that one would win automatically. That's, that's the deal breaker. It's, it's just that simple. They would communicate, ask for each other's view of things, and yeah, uh, whichever one loses that, it, yeah, that is the, the tie break. It's just timestamp. Yeah, and we can go deeper. So after all, I just want to give other people the opportunity to ask questions, but we can go deeper into that. So if there's other questions. Yeah, there's one there. We're making you walk, sorry. <laughs> uh. Why not uh, buy the cheapest Raspberry Pi and uh, build uh, three members with ETCD and don't have all this mess? Sorry, what was the question? Why not use Raspberry Pis and have three oh. of them? So, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so the problem is Raspberry Pis are not enterprise grade. So when, we, when we're looking at having enterprise grade solutions, most of our enterprise customers do not want to use Raspberry Pis. They want to use something more ruggedized that are familiar with, so Intel, Dell, Lenovo, all of those thin clients, it's what they're more, comf more comfortable with. We can use Raspberry Pis, that's fine. And like, like we said earlier, uh, we do support Kairos, which is an open source project as well uh, that, we, that we maintain. And we have Morrow here doing a talk later 
uh, and Kairos does support Raspberry Pis as well. So we could use Raspberry Pis. And, and to your point, if that's what you want to do and you want to use that CD and use three Raspberry Pis, by all means, you can do that, right? We're just giving you an alternative that if you want to reduce costs and still use an enterprise-grade solution with Dell, Lenovo, Intel, Nooks, sometimes quite expensive, especially when you start adding GPUs onto these things. We're talking about $10,000 uh, 10, $1, a box or $500 to $1,000 a box, then it starts to becoming, starts to add up. So that's, that's the reason. And it's not just hardware. There's cabling and other considerations that, I mean, might sound like nothing for a couple cables, but multiply that by 10,000 and you are saving cost in places other than the hardware. Yeah. And also you get rid of etcd, right? So you don't have to do etcd restores. Maybe Postgres, but you know, pick a poison. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Yeah. Sorry over there. And thank you so much for the questions. We love the engagement, by the way. Hi. How you do you bootstrap after a power failure? Full power failure of both nodes. Very good question. So the way it works is with, with our solution, we, we do ISO bootstrapping. So what happens is actually in these nooks that we have here, I have actually a bunch of USB sticks. <laughs> So uh, for, the, for, the, for the talks and the demos that we're doing. So you bootstrap with an ISO, you bootstrap the NOC with an ISO, and that will have uh, all it needs to talk back to pilots. So there's no inbound connectivity, it's all outbound. So you bootstrap uh, the NOC, Dell, whatever it might be with an ISO. That ISO basically has the initial operating system that it needs to communicate with pilots. It might also have all the local content required, like for example, all the different dependencies as well, so it doesn't have to pull anything from the internet, like the operating system. Once actually it's registered in Pilot, you'll be able to then swap. If it's a running cluster, you can swap in the node pool. And uh, if you're creating a cluster, you just add that node, which is registered, onto the cluster, and then Pilot will bootstrap Kubernetes on top of it. So answering your question very simply with, a, with an ISO USB stick. Yeah. And it's headless and zero touch provisioning. So we, you, don't, you actually can ship these boxes onto your retail stores, factories, whatever it might be, plug them in, put the power cable in or the wireless, and then they will, once they reach out and talk to pallets, it's zero touch provisioning. You deploy the cluster, it builds, and life is good.